and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of Fragment Skies, which is going for the feel of a console RPG in a world of monsters and magic. The one and only Chiara Javeri. I, I know I screwed it up there, my apologies. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, thank you. I got my coffee, I am good to go. <laughs> Nobody trusts me with coffee these days. Can't imagine <laughs> why. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a bit of a tradition around here to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what made it stick? So, I was first introduced to tabletop role-playing games um, when I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, I started playing Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 with a group of friends. And that was my first experience with something like that where you roll dice you have a character sheet there's a lot of role playing involved there's combat it's there's there's so many dynamics in there that you don't get with other board games at least not typically so that kind of drew in my attention um and then the creative mind that i have kind of took that and was like hey i could probably take this and make it my own make things better. So I started playing with certain mechanics and whatnot, uh, tweaking the rules a bit, and um, over the course of the next 16 years have made something completely my own from that. Like, there are similar mechanics in Fragment Skies to 3.5, because that was where, the, where it was conceived from. But aside from the typical, you know, though there's monsters and there's magic and there's a D20 system. Everything else is original for the most part. And then throughout the process of of making this, being the nerd that I am, uh, watching all the anime, playing all the video games, inspiration and ideas from those concepts just kind of made their own way into what Fragment Skies was becoming without me even noticing. If I'm being completely honest, I didn't realize that that's what I was doing until someone else pointed it out, and I thought, oh, yeah, you're right. That is how this is working. Mm -hmm. So it like, took all of my interest and made it into something new and interesting and a lot of fun. Yeah. And... When it comes to when it comes to part when it comes to part of the ins, part of the inspirations you mentioned, you talk about having the having the feel of what I call a console RPG. I have my history with the phrase JRPG. I'll get I'll get into that another time. Um, that's oh that's a very wide net. Just in, just in terms of playstyles, tone, genre, subgenres, and so on. So, what were so what were some games within that within that genre that served as major inspiration for what would become Fragment Skies? Working on the video game side, um, mm -hmm. uh, common theme I found was like skill trees, which uh, when you level up in Fragment Skies, you have um, traits, you have abilities. You have all these things that have prerequisites, and you unlock them one at a time, but you have options while going through this unlock process. So it kind of shows off that sort of skill tree mechanic. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, talking about specific video games, uh, Kingdom Hearts, uh, Final Fantasy XIV, those two play, played a large role in that. Um, Did you start in the 1.0 era or A Realm Reborn? Uh, I started in a realm in a realm reborn. Ah, all right. I mm -hmm. I can get that. Now, before we before we even get into the weeds when it comes to talents, when it comes to class trees and the, and the like, 
There is one thing I, I want to nail down first and foremost, and that is what I like to call the Rome effect. You know, you've probably heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome in some form or another. And yeah, there is a similar concept with that in TTRPGs. I can't say for certain when this happened, just that it did at some, at some point, probably in the, I want to say, I want to say the late 80s, early 90s. Um, when it comes to these kind of things, you can never really nail down what nail down what the patient zero was, obviously. But mm -hmm. it was what it was the shift between um, using die to re to do a bunch of subsystem resolutions, a carryover from the wargaming scenes of the 70s, or you instead and instead you go with a particular die resolution system that is the primary one that's that's used in a bunch of different ways depending on circumstance you know the d20 system is one good example of this the primary primary resolution is that 20 sided die um in in something like world of darkness the primary resolution is a success based d10 pool and so on with Fragment Skies, what is the Rome? What is the primary resolution mechanic? Uh, so it does use a uh, D20 system. Mm -hmm. um, I chose D20 because it's the most familiar system to a lot of people who are into the TTRPG um, world uh, family, as it were. You know, Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons, all, all the a lot of the big ones use a D20 system. So it is mm -hmm. familiar in that way. And you have things such as your uh, natural resistances, which is most similar to like your saves. You have your features, which are most um, relatable to like your ability scores. Um, you have skills. Uh, and whenever you're encountered with the scenario, your game master will have you roll a d20, adding one of these things to the result to determine the outcome. Mm-hmm. And with that, with that in mind, would it be fair of me to say that you're that you're doing an aim high, not a aim low, like um, fading suns? Well, kind of, but I'm getting I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. So interesting. You should bring that up. Originally, it was a roll low for some things, but roll high for others, which got kind of confusing. Like. How it used to be is, okay, so this is my uh, dexterity feature is, you know, 14. My objective is to roll below that 14 on a d20 for it to be a success. So there wasn't really any, like, challenge ratings or uh, required rolls um, in re uh, if we're referring to what is used in Fragment Skies. It was just, here's your thing, you roll a d20 and try to get below that. Uh, but that proved... Not interest, not what's I'm looking for. Not as much fun as I would like, and uh, my alpha testers mm -hmm. didn't like that either. So it was just kind of like a group decision that this should be changed. So that's when I converted it back from a roll low system into a roll high system and took that across the board, which actually opened up a lot of new things I could add because now I can increase that stat, which increases your. Uh, probability instead of is I can do that indefinitely, um, <laughs> uh, potentially in indefinitely. While if you're rolling low, you you can only really roll so low before you get to that zero, you know. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. just worked out a lot better to have a roll high system. Mm -hmm. Now, with th with that said, given that you're that you've cited. Um, 3.5 is one of as one of your bigger inspirations. That brings a few questions that I did I did want to ask. Since it's sounding like you're do like you're doing some degree of a, some degree of a tree system when it comes to um when it comes to your classes. Is what? it yeah, is it go one of the one of the things that 3.5 got a bit notorious for was the was some of the ridiculous prerequisites that happened with feats? <laughs> you know, 
Um, if whirlwind whirlwind attack has been my whipping boy in that system for the longest time when it comes to this sort of thing, just because of the sh if you recall the sheer amount of requirements that you needed for it. Um, I don't recall that one. This was 16 years ago that yeah. I played this. Um, this version. For to refresh your memory, you needed Dex and Intelligence of 13, and you needed the fault. You needed a basic attack bonus of four. And you needed the following uh, feats. Yeah. Combat expertise, dodge, mobility, and spring attack. <laughs> I remember all that shenanigans for so many things. Just, yeah, so the just prerequisites to do the spring in... attack that you'd see in like Legend of Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so while there are prerequisites, none of them are that ridiculous. Mm -hmm. All of them have one, two prerequisites max. And a lot of them don't even have prerequisites because it's just this thing you get, or it's the start of a tree. Yeah. Um, and it's set up in the way of like, okay, at level one, be able to look through the things and be like, okay, so I want to be able to have this ability. What do I need for this? I need this and this. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then it's really easy to get there. Yeah. For most of the things, there's only a few. Uh, traits that I can think of off the top of my head that are like, you can't get those till late game. But that's not because you had to have a bunch of different things. It's just because you had to have this thing high enough. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not a bunch of prerequisites for anything. Yeah, and it's... The other... I do... Rec well, the other thing that I personally had picked on it was the distribution of skill points. Back in mm -hmm. back in three point five and a, and a few other games had this problem as well, of ti of um tying sk tying um skill points to say class, which ends which and which um I understand I understand why to emphasize certain classes over others when it comes to mm -hmm. using skills, but it had the unfortunate side effect of create of I won't say creating but contributing to the stereotype of the dumb f of the dumb muscle fighter mm -hmm. and so I'm curious how you're how you're approaching it when it comes to a relationship between classes and say skills points okay uh, so let's just can I screen share not on this one uh, so there there is a skill point system so mm -hmm. depending on what class you get uh, whatever class you get you get uh, five skill points and two different skills. Mm -hmm. There is a skill point maximum that you can have depending on level increments. Fragment Skies has a leveling system from one levels one to levels 100. Mm -hmm. Big number, but you level fast, so it's fine. So if I were to look at a brawler, for example, referring to that uh, dumb brute kind of f fighter type, you get five points in the Sunder and Unarmed Fighting skills. And then you get eight skill points to distribute freely, and uh, when you level, you get additional skill points every fifth level. Mm -hmm. There is nothing telling you where these skill points are supposed to go. You can put them wherever you want. So if this dumb brute brawler wanted to be better at something else, anything else, they have that option. They can be good at sleight of hand, or they can be good at sneaking, or they can be knowledgeable and have a bunch of skill points and all of the knowledge skills, such as like religion, wilderness, um, mm -hmm. mystic, all these things. So your you, your class is more of a suggestion mm -hmm. at the end of the day. But you can make your character good at whatever you want them to be good at when it comes down to it. Yeah, the way you're describing it, it sounds like a archetype system and by that I'm by that archetypes in the way I've um, described it is kind of a middle ground between a lit between a linear class-based affair and something that's more freeform both of them have their advantages and disadvantages an archetype is more about a leaning a what a um what are you sli what are you slightly better at than uh, than others as opposed to this is the specific things that you can do kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, would that be an accurate description of how you're treating adventurer class? I I think I think so. I think so. Mm -hmm. The only thing that 
uh, how do I word this? So there, there are certain traits, abilities, uh, whatnot that have the prerequisite of a of having or not having a certain class. Um, but aside from that, it's just kind of the class is whatever you want it to be. So I think yeah, archetype would be the best way to describe how classes work. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind. Because of my namesake, I kind of I kind of have to ask this. But mm-hmm. part of the reason I have the mo- I have the whole monk part of my name is that was an archetype that I played uh, that I played a lot. Even if in some games I had a harder time t- playing that archetype than others. And yes, I have, to, fun. I have to I have to throw the three point five monk in, into the into the blender for this because of the. Um, <laughs> multiple ability dependency problem or mad that it has um but in your system how would someone build the equivalent to the monk archetype in terms of that um unarmed ma- unarmed um expert combatant so realistically any class can be good at unarmed fighting um i have plans to add a additional class later that it kind of has more of that specialty in it, but all of the special monk stuff is uh, amongst the um, abilities and traits that every character has access to. Mm-hmm. Um, so really, you could take this musclehead brawler that knows nothing about an axe and be like, no, instead, I'm going to make you good at unarmed fighting as well. So you put a bunch of skills in unarmed fighting, get enough skill points in there, now you can unlock um, this trait that... Uh, gives you an armed proficiency, which allows you to add your battle caliber to your roll to hit. Because normally, for unarmed fighting, it's just a straight d20 roll. You don't get to add anything to it. And then with that one, you can go further up the skill tree and get things like, um, uh, what's it called? Martial prowess, I think? Stand by. Martial prodigy. That gives you all... Oh my goodness. Yeah. Which gives you um, so much other bonuses to it. So... Like and there's uh, an ability that gives you like the stunning fist or stunning strike, um, kind of thing. So any class can realistically be a monk. Mm-hmm. I c- I can I can get I can get that and um, it because of that design, it also sounds like it would be very easy for someone to be a gish if you're familiar with that term. And I am not. Re- refresh my memory. Gish, which has its origins in Gith, as in like Gith Zerai, um, is a shorthand for archetypes or builds or what have you that are sufficiently adept in co- in um physical combat and spellcasting. Okay. You know, your, your your mag- your magic knights, your spell singers, that your um rune knights in some cases, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and based on how you're describing it, it sounds like it would be, it wouldn't be too difficult for somebody to be able to do a little bit of sword swinging and doing a, and do a little bit of um casting. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> it's really easy to to mix like that. Mm-hmm. Now, when I go through, as I'm going through the character sheet, there's a few things that I noticed that I I did find a bit interesting. Okay. Um, one of the obvious things, and I I kind of lampshaded it, but the fact that notice is a base feature. Yes. Um, as opposed as opposed to a as opposed to a skill like it like it was in some games, you know. The good old spot check and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, what made you want to make it a core attribute instead? Um, so that was actually a decision made through the alpha testing that just became overall more efficient. Like, if you think about it, at least when, when I think about it, being perceptive isn't necessarily a skill. It's just kind of a natural thing that is about you like if you happen if you're able to catch things off in your peripheral it's not because you've been 
necessarily trained to do so. It's because it's just how your mind works. Mm -hmm. Which is certainly understandable. Oh, especially especially when we when we look at um, characters throughout fiction who are some measure of that. <laughs> it's not. It's um more. It's more of a natural talent than it is something that is trained. That's not to exactly. that's not to say that you can that it can't be trained. It's just some people that the floor is going to be higher than others. Mm -hmm. Now, the other the other um, element I wanted to dive want to dive into on the sh on the sheet is the notion of having a pr of having a primary and secondary weapon in this um, setup and the amount of space given. It's it sounds like there's a significant amount of of aspects that your weapons will will bring to the fray. Definitely the potential for that. So enchanting magical items, that sort of thing is is kind of a kind of a big deal. And mm -hmm. um, since we're talking about weapons, I'll go specifically into those. Every weapon has uh, five what's called enchantment slots. Um, which kind of brings in that video game mechanic, mm -hmm. you know, of like, if you look at Final Fantasy, for example, you would say this weapon has five materia slots, mm -hmm. essentially. So and when you enchant a thing, you can put multiple things on it. So that one weapon, you have all this space, you know, you have the space right next to where it says primary that you can put the name of the thing, and this whole box you can put everything about it. Um, all weapons have what's called a weapon equation. Mm -hmm. Equation, big word, scary, not that hard <laughs> to, to understand. Like, this weapon has this range and does this many die of damage per this feature with this crit range. That's the whole equation. Really simple, really straightforward. So you have that, and then you also have the extra space to put, list all of the things that could potentially be on that weapon. And I put a primary and secondary one there, because it's the idea of like, okay, I have a sword sheathed on my back, or on my side, but I also have a bow on my back. So I have two weapons readily available. You can still have other uh, weapons in your bag, but those aren't readily available. So mm -hmm. having them there, having them in the primary and secondary slots, they're, they're quick access, you know? And typically it's for like, I want to have a melee, rep melee weapon available, but if I catch myself having to run away or, or whatnot, I still have that ranged option readily, readily available. Mm -hmm. So it's more a matter of be, of having a having a primary and a and an easily accessible backup. Exactly, which I think I was actually pulled that from probably Call of Duty games, being like, okay, I have my assault rifle, but then I can press a button and now I have a pistol. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny you bring it's funny you bring up COD because I know I know for a lot of people that they will take pot shots at the. To, at the two weapon setup, and some of the, some of that is understandable because a lot of games have used it without understanding why it was done in the first place. The reason why say the reason why say say Halo or or, or earlier COD you utilized it was because so many of the weapons were very focused in terms of what they were good and bad at, hmm. and. When you and when picking one, a certain commitment is made. Now, granted, mm -hmm. some so, granted even back then there was a bad habit of lampshading certain enemies with certain weapons, like in the original um, Halo. If if you were going to be up against vehicles, you'd probably find a rocket launcher just before the just before the firefight, which is yes. <laughs> which is kind of kind of telling that in advance. And <laughs> with um with COD, there were because of the way kill streaks worked, some weapons got more use than others. Um, looking mm -hmm. at you, SMG rushers, you know what you did. <laughs> <laughs> then, then again, I'm somebody who puts claymore to the top of ladders, so what do I know? <laughs> Smart play. Smart play. It's also really good at harvesting salt. You know, somebody climbs right up a ladder, <laughs> and the first thing they see is front toward enemy, and then yep. they have no yep. face. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> I've been there. I've been on both ends of that. Oh. This, or the or the people who look me, look at me as basic because I'm always doing shotgun runs. Oh. If you want to blame anybody for it, blame id. <laughs> but the <laughs> the point the point is is that er, is that early on you had a bunch of very specific weapons, but once all the attachment stuff started coming in and weapons became became more generalized, there's not as strong of a reason to have it. Oh. Uh -huh. Especially especially since like in say Modern Warfare two, you had the relationship with perks where if you were using say a um LMG, you were probably gonna be picking Scavenger. Yep. Oh. Or or Juggernaut if you wanted to piss everybody off. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Which guilty. <laughs> But w speaking of, just below that on the sheet, one other thing I wanted to ask about is battle caliber, since it seems that's on kind of a a metered setup compared to some of the other parts of the character sheet. Yeah. So your battle caliber. So how did I define this? That is not uh, where I want to be. Um, hold on, I'm trying to find how I define battle caliber because I defined it very cleverly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not what I want. This? There you are. Um, <laughs> that doesn't actually tell me what I want to do. Uh, so battle caliber is... The most accurate way to, to find battle caliber is your expertise in combat. Um, on the character sheet, it is kind of metered. They're, they're ticks. Right? Mm -hmm. So, like, whenever you get an increase to your battle caliber, you put a mark in there. Um, when you get into the yellow orangish space, that is considered as having a high battle caliber. Um, as you progress through leveling, you'll passively gain battle caliber, because, you know, you're going through, going through your adventure. You're fighting things. You're just naturally getting better. But how much it goes up, like how often, is determined by your class. Um, each class has a role. Going back into that video game aspect, you have your tanks, you have your healers, you have your utility. Your, you have your tanks, you have utility, you have healers, and you have um, DPS. Okay, mm -hmm. which I think I actually combined tanks into utility. Everybody the knows way. the golden triangle. <laughs> So, of course, classes that are more focused on damage, more focused on combat, they are going to get uh, battle caliber increases more often than, say, the healer. That's just the passive, okay? That's just what you just get from playing the game. In addition to that, you have traits uh, and whatnot that increase that battle caliber further, such as the weapon finesse trait and then the weapon focus skill, the weapon focus tree. Which the difference between there is that weapon focus gives you a bunch of things up front, um, mm -hmm. but there's no like that's all it gives you as far as weapon goes. But it gives it to you right away. A weapon focus will eventually give you more than weapon finesse as you get further up the tree, but that'll further give you an advantage in battle caliber. When it comes to attacking, uh, whenever you make a roll to hit with a weapon that you are uh, efficient with you will be able to add your battle caliber as the roll to hit modifier. Mm -hmm. So if you have a battle caliber of like six, for example, and you roll that d20 to attack, you get to add six to the roll. That is against the target's dodging ability. Uh, your dodging ability is, I think I changed it to, yeah, is half of your starting base wisdom. Um, a half of your base wisdom plus your battle caliber. So if your wisdom feature is like a 12, for example, then your dodging ability would be 6 plus your battle caliber of 6, so your dodging ability would be 12, and that's essentially your armor class. Mm -hmm. Which I... will suddenly go up over time. Yeah. So in that regard, would it be akin to, would it be fair to call it a momentum kind of system? Um, depending on your definition of momentum, I don't think so. Oh. 
Okay, fa okay, that is fa that is um, fair. Um, now this brings me to one one particular question. That's kind of the that's kind of an elephant in the room when it comes to um, fantasy gaming, okay. and that is the that is the magic that is the magic situation. Obviously, oh boy! Some, obviously, <laughs> some games do wait do way too much magic while simultaneously claiming that they don't. Um, this is where you have the infamous Godzilla issue of of certain games having mages that are entire parties unto themselves in terms of usefulness. Looking at you, cleric. <laughs> so I love magic. Mm -hmm. um, Fragment skies. Magic plays a big role in Fragment Skies. There are over 500 different spells in this game. Um, if you are a casting class, you will likely have access to at least 100, minimum. And that is the going to be like the lower end casting class, which I believe is Misorum, is the one that gets the least amount of spells. Um, I did a lot of work with spells. It, it is a very... When you decide to incorporate magic into a tabletop role-playing game, there is so many things to consider. And um, <laughs> as that goes, I'm, I'm still trying to figure everything out. As far as mechanics, I got that sorted out. Um, going through revisions, I'm constantly going through spells that I've already revised and re-revising them constantly because there there are just so many things to think about especially when you have that many different spells which is not saying i don't like having that many spells i love having that many spells i think it makes the game very very interesting and allows that it gives like more versatility um and gives you more choices when being a caster so the way the magic system works is uh let's look at the magician class a magician is going to be the um Basically, the wizard equivalent. Mm -hmm. Lots of spells, very squishy. Um, I heard you like spells, so I put some spells in your spells so you can magic while you magic. Exactly. <laughs> um, so on the character sheet, you'll see that you have a magic stat. That is, um, <laughs> took a while to guess, that is your, your magic prowess. When you cast a spell... Um, you have the base tier that it's cast at, which there are five different tiers. Uh, tiers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Unlocked. You unlock a new tier every 20 levels. Um, whenever you cast a spell, you have the potential to cast it at a higher tier, uh, depending on what your magic stat is and if that spell allows it. So take a simple spell of, let's see, Flare, for example, which is a Magician exclusive spell. Um, it costs an additional three spell power, and you can increase the tier for every once for every 120 points you have in your magic stat. So, its base tier is one. If you have at least a magic stat of 120, you can then cast it at tier two, which will consume more spell power as opposed to spell slots. So there is like a mana system. When you cast a spell that requires a save, which is going to be uh, your target rolling one of their natural resistances determined by what the spell says, the required roll or um, challenge rating of that save resistance check is going to be equal to your start, whatever your base um, spell casting feature is, which for magicians is going to be intellect. So like if you have an intellect of 15, for example, that is your base. So the save would be equal to 15 plus the tier of the spell. So as you cast, some, cast spells at higher tiers, that increases the uh, required roll for the target to save against that spell. Now, when it, when it comes to magic, usually it'll be under some sort of limited resource. Some, sometimes yes. it's MP, sometimes it is spell charges that you have to wait eight hours for for reasons that are never explained. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, it, sometimes it is adding risk to an area, like in my friend Trevor's Veil of the Void project. Uh, with, 
with fragment skies, what would be the limiting factor? Um, so all around for spells, it's going to be your players or your character's spell power, hmm. which um, it is like a mana system, like I mentioned. If we go back to the example of the flare spell costing three spell power per tier it's cast. So every time you cast it, that's going to cost you three spell power. Mm-hmm. Every school of magic, which there are only four schools of magic, um, which is um, spatial, radiant, dark, and nature, mm-hmm. each one has different ways of re- regaining that spell power, sort of. So for spatial casters and for radiant casters, the only way that they re- regain spell power um, is from reading from a spell book. Mm-hmm. Reading a page from a spell book takes one minute of time, which allows you to use that during downtime as opposed to waiting for a full rest to recover your spell casting ability. Right? So if you're low on spell power and the rest of your team is getting drunk at a tavern, you can be upstairs in the room reading from the spell book, getting back some spell power. Mm-hmm. Um, when you get into the nature category, it gets a little bit different. So you have nat- you have natives and chantlers, which chantlers are uh, essentially druids, but much more healing focused. Mm-hmm. Their spell power comes from their animal companion, which will gain spell power by itself from completing a full rest. So the animal companion recovers spell power, then you have to pull it from your animal companion to regain your spell power. Natives um, are able to uh, meditate, basically, and get back their spell power slowly over time. So these two classes, uh, the native and the chantler, recovers, uh, have a lower spell power maximum because they can recover faster. Then we get into the dark magic, which you have a sorcerer who recovers spell power through a spell book. And you have the misorum that is a little complicated, kind of interesting, very different. They steal spell power um, from things that they kill. So in order for a misorum to recover spell power, they have to kill something using their class gift called Condemn, and that's how they recover spell power. Mm-hmm. So, and because of the fact that you mentioned casting by tiers, it sounds like there are means of overcasting to create a stronger effect. Sort of, yes. So the highest tier any spell can be cast is tier 5. Bottom line. That is it. Tier 5 is the highest tier you can cast any spell. Um, But you can only upcast a spell if your magic stat allows it, which every single spell that is able to be cast at a higher tier will tell you how much spell power is required, and that's determined by the school in which the spell is. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, now with 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 that said, when it comes to when it comes to casting, um, I'm get I'm guessing that if somebody wanted to focus heavily on casting, that the even if there are gishes, the um, physical aspect would would um, take would take a hit in terms of how far it's developed. Um. Yes and no. Really depends on where you put your traits at. Mm-hmm. So. If you are, say, if you're a magician, for example, okay, you're squishy. You don't have a lot of life. Your defense set is low. Makes sense. But if you wanted to still be good at unarmed fighting, you were able, you could be able to do that without diminishing your spellcasting ability. Because your spellcasting comes from your class, while being good at unarmed fighting comes from your skills, traits, and abilities. Mm-hmm. Depending on how you want to uh, distribute your, like how you do that, you may be at a loss a little bit for special things that you can get through traits, such as like the, um, such as like spell focus, the uh, uh, spelling traits, which is basically meta magic. Um, there's other magical things that boost your spellcasting ability, but those 
cost the same number of resources, sorry, they, those cost the same type of resources that you would be using to get those special unarmed fighting things. So there has to be some kind of way in balance there to be kind of losing out on like the specialization of being a magic caster with the, but not necessarily using losing or hindering your ability to cast powerful spells. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, one of the other one of the other parts that was that was on it in regards to elemental magic was focus points. What yes. exactly does that does that entail? So every class that can use elemental magic and and the scout specifically uh, gets focus points. You get one focus point per fifty points you have in your magic stat. Um, those focus points are specifically used for elemental magic and a few things here and there that also consume focus points, which would be specified in by, by like what it is. For example, a scout's ability to basically gain advantage on a ranged attack that consumes a focus point, just to give an example. Other than that, we look at elemental magic, and there are six different phases of elemental magic. Phase one being considered as a cantrip, so uh, anything you can do with phase one doesn't consume resources. But that also means that they're typically just can they're, they're cantrips, right? They're not very strong, they don't really do a whole lot for you. But when you get into like phase two, phase three, up into those higher phases, those consume one focus point. Um, it's consume a number of focus points to use equal to the phase minus one. So like phase two would cost one focus point. Um, so that's where those focus points are mainly for. An elemental magic gives you a sort of elemental bending for fans of Avatar The Last Airbender. You'll know exactly what, I talk about, what I'm talking about. Um, each phase of magic has three different ways you can use it. There's attack form, defense form, and utility form. So you have a lot of things you can do with elements, um, which will consume those focus points. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, with the other with the other thing that I know I noticed regarding abilities, there was the concept of the aura counter. Is, yes. Is would that would aura would the aura counter be or ACs as you shorten it? Would that be the equivalent to an MP system, but for non-magical abilities, or for certain non-magical abilities? More or less. So the lore of the world, or the game, rather, what would you even call it lore? So every entity um, possesses, every living thing is like has an aura to them, a natural energy. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of my justification for being able to do things superhuman. Um, aura counters are most dominantly used by abilities. Uh, and every ability consumes a certain number of these counters of your natural ability, uh, natural energy to you. Um, looking at this here, the, or, um, abilities aren't, they, they all consume a fair bit. And aura counters are considered precious, they're valuable, because when you spend aura counters, you usually spend a a, a large, large amount. No character can ever have more than thirty at any given time, and you only get one d six back after completing a full rest. Mm -hmm. So they're slow coming and fast going. But the things you can do with aura counters are. Your abilities, which are very strong things, such as Blitz Strike, which allows you to attack several times in a single turn. You also have your weapon skills, uh, such as like claw, sh claw Slash, which is a specific arrangement of sword strikes result uh, ending in a thrust that does something very specific. Um, there's also elemental abilities, which consume both aura counters and focus points. And we have the prerequisite of being able to use a certain phase of elemental magic, mm -hmm. which kind of takes your bending up a whole nother tier. And this all uses the aura counters, which just represent your natural energy. Now, 
I am gl I am glad for that because it does mean that it's that it's not going to be one trick pony. Meaning that what exactly? Um, there's but you know how I you know how I talked earlier about the dumb fighter stereotype. Yes. There's been there's been a mindset in certain parts of the tabletop world of having martial characters essentially be a one trick pony as the um as the I run up I hit things first char as the Babby's first character yeah run up and run up and hit things and <laughs> I for the longest time have been very critical of this because um, imagine this kind of scenario let's say somebody is somebody um wants somebody's a big fan of the of the swashbuckling affairs in Pirates of the Caribbean I'll I could there's numerous mm -hmm. there's numerous examples I could use, but I'll use that one for this. Um okay. and when they finally get their chance to play in a tabletop game, they want they, they want to do an XP of, you know, your Jack Sparrows, your Will Turners, what have you. Mm -hmm. And they and in that so they have to reduce all of the parries, all of the repasse, all of the footwork, all of the economy of motion that comes from that style of swordsmanship into basic attack. <laughs> boring. <laughs> it's not only boring, it br it um it breaks it breaks the fantasy, it breaks the immersion. Yes. Yeah, that and... is something I paid a lot of attention to mm -hmm. when generating this game. So, a big problem I have is is just that. Like if you are that primary DPS class, if you are that fighter, all you do is you walk up and you hit things and your turn is over. And that just ruins so much. I've, so I've seen much some argue things. I've seen some argue, but you, you can you can get feeds, you can get cleave, you can get power attack. And I say lipstick on a pig is still a pig. <laughs> Those are definitely a thing, but there's some flavor in in that. Mm-hmm. Right, and those aren't the only things that you have access to. Like power attack, yes, uh, there's a thing in Fragment Skies. You do additional damage, you hit harder. But further up the skill tree from that is cleave, which specify specifies that you do a spin. So you kind of have that, like, okay, it's not just I smack three different things; it's I do a flourishing spin around to hit multiple things. Mm -hmm. So you kind of like pair that with the other abilities you have, such as Blitz Strike. I'm tacking multiple times. So now I got, boom, hit you, hit you on the side, thrust, do a spin. And with the way that Fragment Skies is built, you're able to do that in a single turn. So abilities are used in your perform phase, which I should probably break down the order of a turn. So uh, in your turn, you have your movement phase, your action phase, your perform phase, and attack phase in that order. Abilities are used in your perform phase. And unless otherwise specified, after using ability, you can then also do an attack. Mm -hmm. So you could do that flourishing, I spin around and hit a few things, and then also smack something else. So it allows you that kind of role play aspect of like, oh, I'm doing all this? Cool. This is a lot more than just run up and smack something. Yeah. <laughs> as as much as I played monks in in say three point five, it also has the problem because what is flurry of blows if not just multiple basic attacks? That's kind of, that's kind of the issue. That's kind of the <laughs> issue. That's kind of the reason I say the whole lipstick on a pig thing because mm -hmm. in a lot of those situations, um, even if it even if you're adding some modifiers at the end of the day, it's still using the same setup as basic attack. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. So dissecting it that far. Um, when you take out the fancy words and whatnot, it does come down to just a sing, just I'm just, the same method, right? I roll a die, I hit something, I roll for damage. Same general concept, but I worked really hard to try to expand on that as best I could, because mm -hmm. like that's that ha that's how the mechanic has to be done yeah. in a lot of cases, right? Like there has to have to, have to follow the same flow of mechanic. So being able to stretch where I can. And it's something I put a lot of attention to. In the same in the same vein, weapon variety is is just as important because I I talked about the the Babby's first um, character thing. The other the other parts of that of that is 
the most common way to equip a fighter is good is good old sword and board. Mm-hmm. It is the it is the uh, it, it is the equivalent of white guy with acoustic guitar. It is the most it is the most basic ass way to equip a character. Yes. Uh, and for me personally, there's been times where I've tr- where I've wanted to exp- I've wanted to expand on it and gotten some pushback because instead of doing sword and board why not do poke and board you know mm-hmm. you know the good old um the good the good old greco roman approach you know spe- yeah spe- like got your spear and you got your shield mhm oh and some builds did did allow me to do that if, if only when i had a little bit more system mastery but that should never be an excuse regardless of what a young monty cook had said <laughs> Which mm-hmm. I'm, which I know he got called out on multiple times. Um, he had that he had that whole thing of system mastery should be encouraged and system ignorance should be punished, which is why you see some feats in three point mm-hmm. five that are borderline traps. Yeah, following a stereotype. So min maxing. Mm-hmm. Personally, I don't. I'm not a fan. Right. So, like, if, if you're playing a game where you have to min-max in order to beat that ridiculous Dark Souls boss, do it. This is not Dark Souls. <laughs> you want to min-max, go for it. There are definitely ways you could do that. But Fragment Skies is built to kind of stretch out further. Stretch out your legs. Kind of build something not stereotypical you could have more fun with, like you said. You can mm-hmm. use the pokey, the pokey stick and the shield as opposed to like the sword and shield. In fact, in the skies, you can even do, I have a shield and spell casting in the other hand, or there's just so, there's so many possibilities. Yeah. And from not to mention, there's the, there's one particular aspect that's often overlooked when it comes to shields. That is with a shield, you're being given a huge slab of me- a huge slab of metal that's, could potentially be used to just bludgeon somebody. <laughs> that is the option. That is an option. Mm-hmm. Um, as it currently stands, I do not currently have a shield bash in Fragment Skies. Um, currently. I, I, it, it has been in thought, but it, the current rulebook as it is does not have shield bashing. But I did do mm-hmm. something interesting with how shields function. So mm-hmm. when you look at like D&D or Pathfinder, uh, you use it, if you have a shield equip, you have a bonus to your AC. That's it. End of story. That's, that's, all, it, that's all it does. It just passively have a plus two to your armor class as long as you have it equipped. Mm-hmm. Or I think it's the same bonus in Pathfinder. The way it works in uh, Fragment Skies is a little bit different. If you have a shield um, as your primary or secondary weapon, should be secondary, honestly, but it's up there. And you have it readily available, but not necessarily up. It's not necessarily doing anything for you unless you choose for it to. So in order to use a shield, all you have it equipped, you have to say like on your action phase, on my action phase, I put up my shield. Now it's giving you that bonus, but it's also giving you any debuffs that come with using the shield, such as with like a tower shield, now you're gonna. It's gonna be harder to evade attacks. At least you have that that defense up. You could also use your reaction for the round to put up a shield. Mm-hmm. So like, unless you like, unless you specify that the shield is being up, you don't have the buffs or debuffs of using it. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I also saw that you have a um. A section for talents that are given at every twenty-fifth level. Would yes. Though, now a lot of people, when they hear talents, they'd probably they'd probably assume it's the equivalent of feats. But given that it's four talents over the cor- over the course of a hundred levels, would this be more akin to some sort of prestige benefit? Um, no. So talents are. Additional things that diversify or separate your class from other classes. Um, 
every 25 levels, you get a very specific talent. I'm working on potentially making more choices for that, but as it currently stands, it's every 25th level you get the next talent in that class. So if we look at Soldier, the Soldier class, for example, mm -hmm. they're at level 25 talent. So once they hit level 25, as part of the level up process, they also get the Perceptive talent, which uh, looks like it gives them advantage on notice checks. Mm -hmm. Just a passive thing that they have now. So it's not unlike feats in other games, mm -hmm. but feats uh, traits in Fragment Skies are what feats are, are the most like feats. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now, with that with that said, do you what would what would the current page count of the project be so far, and what would be some of the um, lessons that you've taken from your uh, playtest group? So one question at a time. So how big is the rule book? Mm -hmm. I'll opening up that document here. It is currently at 291 pages. All right. Which is a lot. And actually, I don't even think it has all the things I want it to have. No. 291 pages, but it is missing... Um, something else that I'm working on, which is the demo module, which is which I'm, something that I'm planning on putting into this rule book once that's been tested and ready to go. So all in all, this one book should be about 350 pages long, but should include everything you need to play. So it's going to include all of the rules, mechanics, everything like that. It's also going to include, to include a short... Um, excerpt on how to be a game master and the demo module uh, which is a guideline to follow like any module as well as all of the monsters uh, and enemies that can be found in that module so the ideal is that someone gets this book and they have everything they need to play mm -hmm. and um, with with that in with that in mind do you plan on really do you plan on releasing a de a demo or a qu or a quick start in the coming months? So I was planning on it uh if my Kickstarter were to be successful or, or if I were to at least get <laughs> quite a few more backers than I've gotten so far. I had actually planned on doing a beta test which would be I take this rulebook that I have including the demo module and everything with it and give that for free to a bunch of people who would then take that test it communicate with me for any final changes before publishing the final extended edition rulebook mm -hmm. but that is very contingent on people being interested in this project people backing that project because this process is not not affordable for a part-time retail employee, mm -hmm. right? Like I do not make a lot of money. <laughs> uh, I can't afford to do a lot of things. So I'm trying to, that's why I'm trying to outsource. Mm -hmm. And I, I need those, I need those funds. Yeah. So like beta testing, for example, I have everything I need for that. That's good to go. So as far as testing goes, it's fine. But without the funds, I can't publish it. So I can't get that final professionally edited, illustrated uh, product with graphic design, uh, mass distribution, copies, all that, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, kind of a yes and no <laughs> in that. Like I was planning on it, but I don't have the funds necessarily to do any more than potentially still do a small beta test instead of that larger one that I was hoping for. Mm -hmm. Understandable. But with that said, with that said, I'll certainly be keeping an eye on how the project develops, and I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to my, come into my temple and enjoy the madness that <laughs> happens here. I like the temple. There's couches. It's great. Mm -hmm. 
And anytime you <laughs> see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And of course, Amen to that. Yep. and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.